Hey everybody, welcome to the show today. I'm your host, Evan Evans. And to my left, we have Dallas Crane. Hello guys. And Steven Stratbear. What's up everybody? And Kyle Juhas. Hello world. And today we're going to talk about scoring. Yes. On this ongoing educational show designed for score composers and aspiring score composers looking to take their game to the next level. We talk about what you need to hear. It might not always be what you want to talk about, but you need to hear it. And you can comment and ask questions live with us, and we'll answer them. We're here to help you become the best composer you can be for, the, for your long-term success for the next 10, 20, 50, 60 years. If that's something you want to pay attention to, then like, subscribe, share with friends, ask your questions below, and listen up. Yeah, so Evan, I had a, pr I was had a two kind of cool questions that we could dive into, and it's about like good stories and how composers what they should look for when they're looking for f movies that tell good stories. Because I know you don't want to compose music to well, maybe you as a beginning composer should you look for movies that tell good stories, and what what are some things you could look for to help you find those. Mm. The movies that tell good stories, you know, okay, what's some, something? something yeah, you, have, you know. I mean, just to start this conversation, um, I th I would say that it's uh, even more put more emphasis on if someone's a good storyteller mm. than if it's a good story. Good story is kind of subjective. Mm. There's a lot of gradations from lack of story, and people love that. <laughs> they just mm. want to go to the circus and be entertained mm. for an hour or two. Talk like full on story, you know, people who really, really like narrative. And so it'd be hard to say that, uh, you know, how much does that factor for you? But I think if you pay attention to how well someone's telling a story, look at their previous works or look at the work that you're about to be hired for, and really pay attention how well is this story being told. Mm -hmm. And if you start to ask yourself things like, well, what is this story? Then you know, maybe fundamentally they're not even a good storyteller at all. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, that's not going to work for people. You know, right, people right, love right. to see things told well. You know, people like to listen to stories told well. So if it's not, if it's not told well, mm. that could be an indication that just because it's a gig and you're going to do it or you're going to decide if you're going to do it, um, it could be an indication that it may not actually go anywhere because if you're not getting anything out of it. No one else is really either. Mm. Kind of seeing the bigger picture, yeah. You kind of get the whole kind of package there. You're, you're seeing, is this going to be a future client? You know, they just kind of kind of do maybe a few and that's it? Or maybe this might be it? Yeah. You know, I think uh, even, I mean, just from my own experience, I think maybe even keeping an eye out for certain things that maybe might seem unique at first, might seem off, but maybe they have a certain a certain vision or a certain property that they're really trying to push forward. Say the first guy who maybe scored or edited uh, Reservoir Dogs and it's like, why is this film in different parts everywhere? You know, I don't understand, really you know, or, or Pulp Fiction, you know, is a great example. Oh yeah, that's a good example. But yeah. then picking up on things where you're like, well, I see why he did this now and it came, kind of came full circle and I think if you can pick up on that and you can see the genius in it, uh, I think they're like, we even mentioned before the people who try certain things that are their own style but it's more of just lack of confidence or they think they may have a certain idea but it's just they're trying things that they've tried and just doesn't really work out and you know I think it's just keeping an eye for that knowing when you are really seeing something natural and unique mm -hmm. and it's for a sort of uh, uh, you know whatever it is and then kind of seeing something okay this has been done before they, they think this is kind of something special but it's it's not and it's kind of becoming this jumbled mess so. there's so many factors to to you know, being wise really is mm -hmm. what it finally is right. um, hmm. experience knowledge information um, the mentors you've had <laughs> and it's really hard for somebody to begin a career in scoring and go out there and think they're going to be able to make good decisions right away right. I have this thing I say that you know the first 10 years of your career is where you go bronze the next 10 years of your career is where you go silver and now after 20 years when you hit your 30th year that's when you go gold you know, 
takes a long time to get all this information lined up. Information, experience, experience, and information turns into wisdom. Wisdom, wisdom is usually knowing what not to do. Right. You right. can't know that unless yeah. you've made the mistakes or learned from mentors what not to do, and they explain to you because they've made X mistakes in the past. This is why you should not do that. So then you understand it fundamentally why not to do that, <laughs> and that's wisdom being passed on, and then you gaining that as wisdom. Well, wisdom, too, is really important when you're in the territory of the unknown, when you're breaking ground and doing your own art. You know, you can't look at what people have done before you to kind of gauge what's going to happen because it hasn't been done. Yeah. So the the wisdom is really, you know, the experience that you have and the the skills you know, and then the, the foresight to, you know, project all kinds of, you know, future possibilities and understandings and you know, just play with the things in your mind so you can go into those unknown territories. Yeah. So having entered, uh, just about entered the gold segment of my career, <laughs> it's coming, a couple more years, I've been doing this for about 25 years, you know, I, I highly recommend you guys just kind of like listen to all these little nuggets we're saying that if you're going to choose to work on a project or not, you know, make it about something like what we're talking about, something a little bit deeper than... I don't know, the money or the relationship, actually look to see, is this guy going anywhere? <laughs> look to see if that particular client has potential, you know? Right. Kind of like, you know, they're going to interview you and they're hiring you, but, you know, think of it the other way as well because this is your life. Everyone you create a relationship, you're hiring in your life, right. you know? That's, the, you know, you're the job of your life. <laughs> and so, you know, look into somebody a little bit deeper you know check out check out how good they seem to be and and also realize that maybe you're not a good judge of that yet and that that might take 10 20 30 years for you finally to be a you know a crack at and so ask a mentor ask somebody who has 10 20 30 years of experience to help you make some of those decisions or help you think about how to make some of those decisions Interesting. Yeah. I would add to this um, whole discussion too. We were talking about like lame movies and stories and stuff. Um, you know, if you've got nothing else to do, why not take on a lame story? And then the other thing too is you said like a good storyteller. Even good storytellers kind of have a doozy of a movie. And if that's a good in for you with that filmmaker, then I would say go for it. Yeah, I mean, I mean that could be like the low hanging fruit. And yeah. the next one can be there. Yeah, I mean, great certainly masterpiece. every movie right. of Steven Spielberg's is not like whoa, enthralling, you know. I mean, yeah. Bridge, Bridge of Spies or whatever what was that, you know. Yeah. Just okay, granted, it wasn't scored by John Williams. Maybe that's half the formula for success. Okay, I know you composers <coughs> want to think that out there, but actually, nobody really is, listens to the score when they watch a movie, you know. Yeah. Just you do. Or like BFG, but, like nobody liked BFG. I liked yeah. it a lot, but okay, it was but, just you know, not. It didn't hit like any but, of his but, other movies. Yeah. But what you want to be able to do is to be able to see the potential, see the talent, see it that it's there, and make a decision on that. This might not be this person's greatest project, you know, but they might. You might be able to know that they grasp this storytelling yeah. thing. And it, it may be that they realize it's not their greatest project either. Like I know I've yeah. hired people on like just little tiny projects, and I've given them a shot because I know. That if they screw it up, well, it's not the end of the world. And mm -hmm. that's a great way to, you know, kind of get your foot in the door and show off what you could do. And, right. You know, when they really do a good job and you're like, geez, they made this dumb old thing sound amazing. You know, then you want to bring your good stuff to them. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You I mean, know, so I've been on both sides of that. Yeah. I mean, the screenwriter writes the story. And if that's not the director, then the director, you know, came on board as this other thing and then if it's going to be made into a movie it's because a producer and their investors provided funds and it might not be the story that you know you're way way into but if you're a good storyteller you can tell that story really well and now it's not even your own story but you're a good storyteller and so that's why I say Steve you know to your question that it's more important how good of a storyteller they are because that's actually their job as a director and a producer is to take the story and tell it to the world mm. in movie form 
you know, or video game form, or television episodic series form, or whatever the you know mm-hmm. format is. How how well do they communicate stories? Tell stories. How well do they mm-hmm. tell stories? Yeah. There's um. I, I know we, we make a lot of connections to dreaming when we talk about cinema and the subconscious. And I always think it's funny when you know people relate their dreams, and they're like, "Oh, it's this wild dream, this and this and this," and it's like the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> right, right. But, you know, it kind of goes on with the point that you know the subconscious mind is the greatest storyteller of all, and um, you know it doesn't matter how dumb the story is; it's pieced together in a way that's compelling and gets people really thinking. You know, yeah. and so I'm reminded of a comedian that once said like. He said, like, oh, man, I had this really weird dream last night. Dude, every dream is weird. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really nothing strange about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the narrative power more than the story. The story's yeah. kind of just the vehicle. Yeah, are you a compelling storyteller? Martin Scorsese is. I mean, did you see, uh, what was the one about the, uh, the Buddhist uh, huh. uh, monk? He, he, he did... Um, you know who's the the Dalai? I think it was about the Dalai, Dalai Lama. Lama. But what yeah. was it called? Uh, Seven years to Tibet no, or something. No, no, no. somebody else in William scored that. Philip oh, Glass so. did the score to this one. Oh, is it like that really weird long name? Kundun, Kundun, yeah, Kundun, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> that might be the way you pronounce his name in, in Tibetan or something. Anyway, like Martin Scorsese, he's a really good uh, storyteller, and that movie was like about as boring of a topic as could be and it's just stretched out and elongated as long as it could be and then and then put into like slow motion with Philip Glass and and it was compelling you know at least it was compelling but it was kind of a it was not a great story there was very little there but it was just told well enough that you could enjoy it you know that's the winning equation you can take a good story and tell it poorly and it's not gonna it's not gonna multiply and expand nobody tells other people to go see a movie that they didn't like. They saw it, you got them in the door, you got their ticket, but it's not gonna have geometric growth or multiplicity growth beyond that, beyond the first people that you were able to get in the door with whatever marketing dollars you shoved them into that door. Word of mouth is gonna be, it's just gonna be, it's not gonna happen. Mm-hmm. So you can already, I already, I mean, I'm trying to tell you, you know, through my years of experience that I already see that that's a factor. Like there's the word of mouth factor. Does this have, enough not to get a person through the door and like it but to tell their friends and more friends and everybody on Facebook that's like the most amazing thing I've ever seen you guys gotta go run and go see that you know that's the kind of storytelling you wanna get involved in yeah it's gotta be you've gotta be able to put it into like a little nugget and explain it you know in like one or two sentences what's so special and exciting about it yeah. Well, I mean, Jesus, if you can get anybody to like it enough to say something about it, that's good, too, even if they aren't coherent. Yeah. I, I, th- I think at these days the um, the uh, the test for how popular um, a, a possible topic or something could be is can you reduce it down to a single available emoji? Because I've seen so many things <laughs> yeah, where it's just like true. one or two emojis, and it spreads like wildfire. Um, I don't know why, because uh, maybe it's because the people who think of emoji do so much human research that they find the symbols that relate to everybody in the world the strongest you know so it's it's like an encyclopedia of powerful symbols i don't know or maybe it's just like people like the the symbol you know who knows but that's my little observation lately see if you can put a little emoji next to it tom hines says being experienced means you've made uh, mistakes yeah i think that's very true Mm -hmm. absolutely and uh, let's see eugene asks uh, says, good afternoon, gentlemen. <laughs> and asks, as you all know, Alex North wrote the original music for 2001 A Space Odyssey, but was removed at the last minute. Um, and then he asks, has that ever happened to any of you? Um, and uh, so I guess that opens up a really interesting topic. Um, I had a just a short um, animated commercial that I was working on, and... You know, I gave them the score, and they loved it, and they worked everything out with it. And then at the very end, they just kind of flipped, and I don't really know why. <laughs> but yeah, mm-hmm. but they didn't. They, they never said they didn't like it. They just. <coughs> I don't but know. they didn't. They didn't. They just flipped. Not use it. They probably used something else. Yeah, they used something else entirely. Now, did they use another composer's music? 
It was just like a Pond 5 queue. Oh, okay. It, it, it was just a small little commercial. It, it wasn't big. Okay, well, that's not... But hey, it happened to you. All right. Yeah, so but, there you go. <laughs> but I would say that else. it's pretty rare yeah. that a filmmaker decides to create the musical backdrop of their film so integrally that you couldn't replace those tracks that they put there because they were conveying too much narrative. And 2001 is a really good example of that. I think not even Pulp Fiction is not even a good yeah. example of that because you could probably swap out songs on that, you know. Oh, yeah. And it would still work the same. But in 2001, he chose tracks that actually mean something, like the transition with the bone to the spaceship. You know, he chose the track of um, the Blue Danube, I believe it was. Or no, the also Sprog Zarathustra. Oh, well, there's that, too, as well. Yeah. Oh, I see, when you jump on, on the ship. But yeah. on the jump cut, and yeah, sure. There's all those. Or Clockwork Orange, or um, The Shining, you know. Um, but, but heavily in 2001, that's a special exception, where you had to convey how far mankind has gone into two million years since they discovered you could use bones as tools to now look what we made with that discovery that we can use things as tools you know now we're in space in spaceships you know and so then you have this beautiful music which also represents look at how sophisticated mankind has become and it's an actual piece that everyone understands represents like high class and like it just had so much baggage to it you could never do that with score you you put original score in there and you won't can't say that unless you quote those other things. You right. know, maybe it could have been a cornucopia of like all the greatest uh, classical themes of all time, like all mixed together or something, at most. But you know, using an actual track from like the pinnacle of human achievement in in music for the music was a particular narrative message that was going on there to say, hey, look how far we came as a species, where we can create masterpieces. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, and I think that what happened was the composer did their best to emulate all of those things because probably the filmmaker was saying, you've got to do this. Right, right. It needs to do this. <laughs> and so then it became really close, and then that's that blue ocean strategy versus red ocean strategy where if you're not bringing something original to the table, then you're second rate. You're just a copier, you know, and at that point then it just makes more sense to go with the original idea. Yeah. It already was infused with and included all the wonderful all the wonderful connotations. Right. The other there's no connotations with original music. There's no connotation. So if you want to be a filmmaker at that level where you're using music in a way that it brings connotations, then the, you, you don't need a composer. You're right, you just <laughs> or you need it. a composer who's smart enough to work with you on being able to think like that and maybe bring some ideas to the table that, that do the connotation thing. Yeah, they would have to write something at such a level that it, in the instant that somebody hears it, it creates its own connotation and becomes like self-referential. Right, you know? right. Synonymous with this Well, that's what like quoting motifs is, right? Yeah. Well, like, uh, you know, like John Williams wrote the Olympic fanfare, for example. Oh, or, okay, I'll think of another example. Go ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, he's, he's always been a, an example to me of a composer who can write music for things in the world you know, that people will actually use. You know, and his Olympic fanfare was a, a good one. And so I would, obviously, I think some of his successes, because he can create music that as soon as you hear it, it's like music that should have already existed and somebody had dropped it into the film now. Yeah. It has that same effect as if, you know... Well, like Jerry Goldsmith had a chance to do that several times. His score for Patton was so influential and everyone recognized it that it, that it goes... You know that one mm-hmm. with the drum, mm. dun, 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 dun. you know that you know like in Small Soldiers, he used that for the rally of the troops. Yes. Or a, might even have been, he didn't do the score, but it might even have been used in Toy Story. And, <laughs> oh, uh, I can imagine that. And Gremlins, that was his score, but he was able to self quote, yeah, to mm-hmm. make that connotation, that reference, that yeah. reference. That's a whole other level that you can't get with original score. Like original score, the. The, the words right there, just the original score, automatically take that out of the equation. I'm not going to be able to reference with this anything outside of this movie. Yeah, because you've never heard this before. Because you've never heard this before. And anything that I do that is referential is going to either be direct quotes, and we're going to have to license that and get permission, or it's going to be like, 
kind of pseudo wink wink nod nod knockoffs which you you know is not going to really nail the conveyance of that all the wonderful connotations that the original source track would have now uh, now imagine if you were some top exec you know with a bottomless bank and you wanted to create that effect could you like two years before the film came out create some event or some mm. you know thing and have original music for it mm. right and so it gets out there in the world and people hear it and they associate mm. all these great things and then mm-hmm. the movie comes out two years later mm-hmm. yeah. and that's the soundtrack you've been right. using the whole time yeah, that's cool to kind like, of artificially or like create. Netflix releases a show and like people are like watching some TV shows or thing but like on the TV what they're watching is like Stranger Things you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's like <laughs> and then you end but up watching it's another Stranger show things. but it's another yeah. thing but they've referenced themselves you know but uh-huh. yeah, when you've created the paradigm yeah. shift, you can you artificially use it. create it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I'd be used to that. Yeah. So, what are some other uh, topics we have today? I want to get a little more into what I was talking about last week uh, with some of the different kinds of rock cues people can do. I just want to give some examples of uh, maybe certain artists. If people are kind of like, you know, I, either you really enjoy uh, cinematic music and you're also kind of a fan of, of maybe rock music, any, anything like that, and you kind of want to find that that bridge where it's kind of like these both things kind of in one, it's kind of an interesting thing, whether it's just for your personal enjoyment or if you are looking for some kind of inspiration. Um, but first, I just want to kind of clarify, like when I mean that, I don't mean look for a band and then or look for a certain sound and go, okay, i got to emulate that. I don't mean that at all. I just mean just getting... Influences, just getting your inspiration. You know, okay, this can be. Oh, I, I, you know, this this gave me a great idea for this whole completely other idea. I find myself doing that. I think that's kind of the main, most important thing of going back for inspiration or looking back at your influences. Not necessarily to go, okay, I have to now copy this and emulate this. I mean, in my you know, in my own way, of course. But I don't. I don't think that's ever the case. I think it's more of how can I kind of get these ideas or maybe something new that will just kind of spark from this. Um, but yeah, but like I said, going along the lines of what I was talking about last week is finding maybe, or kind of writing more interesting rock cues for films and such like that. Some of the bands I really look forward or look into and get a lot of inspiration for that, either when I do my mixes or my own writing, uh, would be like bands like Russian Circles, very popular right now. Uh, other bands like them would be like Explosions in the Sky, um, another really, really popular uh, instrumental rock band. They really don't write verse, chorus, verse, chorus. It's in movements. Uh, nice. So they may have uh, good. an intro go on for... Th- Two minutes, three minutes, and it never loses its its energy. It never loses its 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 momentum. It keeps building. It keeps building. You can hear new things getting, being added. They usually will work with a lot of different uh, either choirs, strings, uh, any kind of um, you know a lot of orchestration. They usually work with their songs as well. So you get this really huge full sound. Never it never sounds cheesy. It never sounds uh, like you're watching. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, like a I don't know some kind of a Ad for a, for an army commercial, you know. What I mean, no, not to say it's cheesy, but in that in that kind of that regard, it never sort of crosses those bounds. It's actually kind of funny because one of their songs was used, actually, I believe for like a Coast Guard commercial, and they, they didn't they weren't even notified about it. They're like, what? <laughs> but uh, um, but they, they do. They have a uh, just stuff like that. They have a very unique mix, and it's like I said, it's extremely inspiring. And whenever I listen to that that band, mainly Russian Circles, uh, I'm also a fan of Explosion of the Sky, but. Uh, like I said, they're just uh, extreme, really the best way I can describe them is cinematic. Even before I, you know, got into more cinematic scoring and mixing um, and doing sound design, I they were always were one of my favorite, one of my favorite bands. Just the the ideas they had and just the fact that it's like you were listening to an actual symphonic piece, but in this three piece rock band, I always found that incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, other artists though that sit in the same regard, but maybe do a little more as opposed to introducing different types of effects, sound design, uh, maybe they're really reliant on their pedal setup, whether it is it's their effects pedals, whatever. Uh, a band I like, they're actually from, I believe it's Belfast, uh, and so I watch you from afar. It's become one of my favorites over the past few years. Uh, another one of those artists where you listen to them and you're not getting a verse, chorus, verse, chorus, you're getting these beautiful uh, build-ups, you're getting these awesome transitions, uh, everything just kind of falls into place essentially um, to the point where I, I feel like now when I, if I listen to certain types of music and there's just a first chorus first chorus formula it almost seems kind of unnatural in certain regards it just <laughs> seems like it's like okay now the chorus now the verse you know and <laughs> these guys they, they let the music literally speak for itself and kind of move and you can actually get certain images you can get certain scenes in your head of whatever it is that you could be thinking about or, and I think that's one of those kind of key 
details you should really pick up and notice uh, if you are having if you're listening to something and you're getting these you're literally you're literally playing a scene in your head from something whether it's a movie you saw or it's something you're just thinking about and that's where do kind of you see the uh, that kind of music fitting into score where like what kind of movies I mean for I mean for a band like them uh, say like say in so I watch you from far it's actually interesting they just scored a film two years ago mm. called the the cured um, and it was directed by Danny Freen? Freen? Mm. Pro- apologize, Freen. I, apologize if I Freen. mispronounced your name. Uh, F-R. <laughs> <laughs> it starred uh, Ellen Page, and it was a film about uh, kind of like the aftermath of a zombie uh, outbreak epidemic. Mm. And it was kind of reintegrating these people who were once infected, now kind of back in society. Oh, it's kind of an interesting, interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of like, like oh. ex-zombies. It reminded me of like the ending of Shaun of the Dead, but like in a serious, yeah, yeah, like, yeah. you know, kind of push. Mm. I was thinking of Shaun of the Dead. Um, but uh, I haven't seen it myself, and I, I really do want them to. Really, one of the sole purposes is so I can see the score, uh, so I can kind of hear what they did with it. But uh, the art, yeah, it was the, I believe it was both guitar players for the band. Uh, Rory, uh, I'm sorry, guys, I, I totally mess your names all the time. Uh, <laughs> Rory Fryers and Niall Kennedy, I believe. Um, and, uh, Are you sure this is in the Spinal Tap? <laughs> 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 oh, yes, please, yeah, yeah actually. Limousine, <laughs> no. <so> she. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna be throwing Spinal Tap references out, um, but uh, but no, it's so it's interesting to see. This I hear band. they keep losing their drummers. <laughs> <laughs> you just spontaneously, you know, combusted. Combust. I don't know what happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but um, but no, but kind of, kind of just kind of getting back to it though, it was it's interesting though because it's one of those. It was one of those bands or artists where I remember listening to them and thinking to myself, oh, I could see these guys scoring a film or scoring some, mm-hmm. some type of. Uh, media piece, and sure enough, you know, it was a, I think that was two years ago they did that. It was released in uh, 2017, and I'm, I thought maybe I think I first heard these guys probably 2014, 2015. And, well, these guys could really fit in for that. But to kind of answer your question, though, Steve, yeah, they uh, it's um, a lot of these artists. I mean, you you do have a certain energy. I mean, they are a heavier kind of rock band, you know, a little so maybe more s- films that maybe have more of that kind of connotation to it they have more of that feeling maybe it's an action film I think they fit war films that really surprisingly would fit in well in my mm-hmm. opinion at least um, but just kind of it just I mean like I said too just to give you maybe more ideas if you're trying to figure like how, how can I write a, a more cinematic rock cue I think these are great places just to start not to emulate don't copy but just just mm-hmm. get kind of your head in sort of that space I think that's important there's think, oh Sorry to completely slice that in half. Um, (laughs) There's this uh, interesting phenomenon with film I've noticed. You're talking about like current artists and new guys. Whenever a film tries to be like absolutely precisely current, it's it's weird. It doesn't work. For me, I'm thinking of the Emoji movie where they made it, but it took so long that by the time it came out, you know, Dance Dance Revolution and texting and all this stuff that was cool back then was just not cool anymore. It's not cool anymore, yeah. Isn't that funny? <laughs> you know, and, yeah. I can, and I can see that with the music, too. You know, if they they have this artist that is just, like, on the rise, and then they start making the movie, and then halfway through it, kind of, they just, you know, they say some dumb thing, or they die, or I, I don't know, so, something that kills that career. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the film comes out, and suddenly it's not cool anymore. So I kind of see... In the, like, me- is it and a- in the meantime, simultaneously, you can do a movie like Baby Driver, which uses even old music in a totally fresh and new way that no one ever saw before. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying is the, uh, is the solution to that, is you don't have to worry about the current trends. You go back just a little bit where things are stable, but still in people's minds. Now, you're talking about like you know popular artists that are on the rise... And I was thinking of like music videos in my head from like eight years ago. Right. Everybody's right. like, oh, that's that's not really current it's anymore. Really but it current. feels current. Mm-hmm. You know, so if you have a movie that's even lagging that, it it'll still have the same effect on people. Oh yeah. You know, you could bring that song back and people mm-hmm. would love it. I think that's a one of the actual like a really strong uh, actually uh, choice to make. Bring back an old you know, whether it's from the you know, whether nineties, whatever it is, mm-hmm. looking back and finding that perfect kind of piece of music to fit this psychological aspect of whatever film you're doing. I think it's a very strong uh, movie you can make. I do. I've seen it work a lot of times. I've even had the idea myself, mm-hmm. listening to certain artists and being like, "Oh, what if they made a film about this this video game I really enjoy? What if they used this uh, artist's back catalog? Oh, this would be perfect for. It. I can just hear it right now. You know, it's sort of like the that. cycle of life. It's like by the time you get to the point that golden age of your career where you can start to make some projects and put together some projects, 
about the things you loved when you were a kid, that's right about when it comes back around. It's it, that 30, it's, 35 years Yeah, exactly. Cycle. <laughs> that kind of like wave you ride. The 90s are in. The 90s are really going to be in, in like, right, you know, oh, this yeah. is the next trend is the oh, 90s. Yeah. As soon as Stranger Things 3 comes out, it's going to be over. Completely uh, flat. Uh, yes. yeah. I, I'm, I'm guessing it's going to land and people are just going to be like, Bored out okay. of their minds. Yeah, yeah. they've already kind of got the '80s sci-fi. And it's gonna be all about Nirvana and Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> But it's like, I, 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 oh, oh no! I, I love what uh, in that movie Guardians of the Galaxy how they yeah. went back. But it was cool how it wasn't just a song that was put into the movie, but it was like part of the characters. There you go. Um, like he it was he was something he was into, you know, and it, it made him part of the story, right. which I think has a good impact. Yeah, you know, so, it was, it was yeah, very, yeah, yeah. That was very relatable. Yeah, you know, he loses his his Walkman and it's like the, the most crushing <laughs> thing and like, we've all been there when we were kids you know having that and uh, yeah. at least I, I certainly went there I still go through that if I kept my phone somewhere I'll listen to a song but um, no it's true and I, I think that too that's one of those great examples of like you just said too it's such an integral part of the character you know and, and mm-hmm. now you're feeling and not, not only now do you have this connection to the music on a maybe oh I love that song back in the day if you're you know uh, remember that from when from your childhood now it's like oh now I feel like the character I, I can put myself literally in his shoes how about you guys out there? Do you remember? Do you have any movies that you remember mm. that, in the movie themselves, reference music? They talked about it, or it's like it was such a key part of the actual uh, diegetic on in the story. You know, maybe it was a serial killer. It was a song that they listened to. You know, or you know something just integral to the story and had a story point about it. Comment below, and then and we'll we'll, we'll um, talk about it for a minute. Yes. Yeah, I know. Um, just off the top of my head, Get Smart had the uh, Ode to Joy. Was it Symphony? Mm-hmm. But but in a way that yeah. it was referenced. Yeah, like not from the uh, filmmaker. At, at the climax of the song, the bomb was supposed to explode. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah, and there's actually um, there's I forget which tune it was, but in Looney Tunes, there's one tune too, and they have this bomb joke where the <laughs> You know, the character goes up to the piano and they play this melody. And they always hit the C sharp. Right. No, no, C. Yeah. yeah, and then he's like, no, C, and he hits it and blows himself up. Right. And that happens like four or five times C, with different C. characters. <laughs> Is yeah. that, was that like a Wiley Coyote one? Yeah, or once. And then one, it's like on the piano with like Daffy Duck. And once it's um, Bugs Bunny with the uh, xylophone, mm. like on a concert stage. And he's like, do 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 ging ging. I think it's from uh, The Man Who Knew Too Much, the original yeah. one. There's Alfred Hitchcock and like they're supposed to murder her exactly when there's a calamitous Piotti hit. There's supposed to be someone in the audience, a diplomat that they're going to murder uh, with a uh, rifle shot or whatever, but you'd never be able to hear it over oh. the calamitous moment. Oh. You know? So, but I think someone unearths the plot while the performance the opera performance is going on and so now they have to like figure out you know where is it going to happen and where is it going to come from and when is it going to happen and like I think there was one time that happens and it wasn't it but they thought it was going to be and it's like mm. oh my god or when is it going to be hmm. <laughs> oh man awesome yeah yeah those, those are funny moments yes. uh, some, some moments I think are a little less authentic you, you got like that singing animal cartoon and it's like are these really like songs that they wanted or just the songs they ended up being able to get oh, you know okay. or it's like oh this character liked it, likes this song for extra narrative contractual obligations or something so they just put something random in there I was thinking yeah. of the, the owl cartoon like the very old I think it's I'm sure it was Looney Tunes one it was like the owl and he's singing the like that old fashioned like to the moon like and he's like yes, I want to sing it like like did they did they put that in there just because of yeah there you go yeah <laughs> they, it was just the, what they had or I mean I think it does actually kind of fit the character I mean for, I kind of remember from that <laughs> it's just I think so it kind long. of fit like what he was trying to do I think yeah because his yeah. dad wanted to sing this very stale yeah. kind of uh, piece oh, of music and he one. wasn't into the it the owls yeah the owls yeah <laughs> yeah I remember and, that uh, that was funny oh man I was kind of going back to that um, <laughs> sax spy <laughs> Says, uh, you know, how about cool sax scores? You know, we ever. What are some notable sax scores? Oh, wow. that he asked, "What yeah. are some best scored saxophone cues?" Or how how is saxophone being used in scores now? Um, Naked Lunch. Naked Lunch, yeah, pretty esoteric, pretty cool. Yeah, with it uh, was, um, Ornette, Coleman. Ornette Coleman. Yeah, Howard Shore. There's also that. Uh, what's the one with the with the devil who? Um, he's devil's uh, advocate. No, no, no. 
Uh, he goes down to New Orleans, and it's like voodoo oh, and Mickey, stuff. Uh, Mickey Rourke. Rourke? Yeah. Um, a, what was that called? Uh, uh, like Angel, Angel. Angel something. Heart. Angel Heart. That's Angel it. Heart. That's it. Yeah. 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 Angel yeah. Heart. Yeah. Um, that was very cool. Yeah, kind of jazzy. Jazzy, use of yeah. the saxophone. Bernard Herman on Taxi Driver used saxophone. That was Tom Scott, one of the greatest yeah. saxophone players. And um, Anatomy, players. Of a, Anatomy of a Murder with Duke Ellington. Okay. Mm. And um, Harry Gregson Williams did Metal Gear Solid 2. Mm-hmm. Ah, really yeah. interesting, huh. esoteric, just saxophone shows, just like, bah. kind of mm-hmm. like a, you know, a Native American yodel or something. I'm trying to remember that now. Oh yeah, okay, it's, okay. It's, it's, it's on the, uh, yeah. the uh, not the ship, but the second level. The uh, I do. It's like an oil the, freighter. The big shell. Yeah. yeah, big shell. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I remember that now. Yes. Yeah, so I was going to say I was thinking the, the bridge and the ship. Mm-hmm. For show snake, yeah, you're right. No, it was. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. Also, Blade Runner. Thing. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't think you really get that much anymore. It's just. It's a great. Too much of a 1980 sound now, maybe. But you know, you might be able to use it in in a different way, maybe with with your orchestration. It, it's definitely still hasn't been fully explored. Yeah, it's it's mm-hmm. it's the only woodwind with the flexibility of a string instrument. You know, mm-hmm. like flutes, they don't really have a dynamic range, and oboes are kind of squirrely in all their intervo- intervals, and clarinet is just kind of bland. Mm-hmm. You know, obviously, like all of these are great instruments, but you know, compared to the saxophone, the saxophone you have this very smooth, um, almost analog sound to it, where you can get really any pitch you want. Anywhere. I believe it was invented to try to emulate the human voice. I, I'm I sure. believe so. so, yeah. I believe they, they actually sought out, like, how can we, you know, emulate the human voice or whatever. And so when saxophonists play it, like, really great saxophonists play it, they incorporate a lot of what vocalists incorporated into vibrato, um, you know, throat. And, Slurps and scoops and, and, and bends. And tonguing and uh, articulations of, like, consonants. Subtones, too. Um, yeah, there's all things that, you know... To, yeah, it's a very wide, very expressive instrument. It's just it sounds like a saxophone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's the only problem. You know, so, you know, I've tried to use saxophone on uh, several scores, and I've really pushed it hard, um, but every time it's been axed by the filmmakers, you know, because they had the, the intuition to know that it's out of date. So it's You have hard. to really bar- bury it. You've got to integrate it in a very flavorful in useful way. I'm sure it's it's quite handy in jazzy uh, scores or urban settings. Yeah, anytime you have like big, like West Coast kind of jazz stuff, you have to have the saxophone. So the Incredibles and Despicable Me and the Minions. Mm-hmm. And it's a kind of reference Mario with Kart. that connotation to it. Yeah, like mm-hmm. like big band horn sections, you have to have the saxophone. Well, for sure. Yeah, like but even that, anything. you know, everything is just kind. Of, it's been. It's been injected into a, 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 almost every different way you can use it, you know, and yeah. and it's very distinctive. So I've I've heard it used with like wind band type orchestrations where it's like the low voice and it'll play with the bassoons. You might get one or two of them, and then they play just like really heavy, really low, and it's just and it can be really interesting. It can sound like a double bass but with more color. Yeah, which is really nice. What was the? Oh, okay. Um, and then there's the the score to Last Man Standing by Ry Cooter, and he uses bass sax. Yeah, it's very cool. It's oh, like this big yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. It just sounds like a bulldog. Yeah, mm-hmm. I I would imagine. I don't. I can't think of anywhere, but I would imagine it would fit well in um, Hateful Eight. That would be a yeah. score where like a, a bass sax would fit really mm-hmm. well. Yeah. Just kind of this awkward lumbering. Absolutely. No. Um, no finesse yeah. at all to the sound. Just like full darkness. Yeah. Yeah. Edgy <laughs> darkness. But it's not like a bass pulse either. Like it's very much up front in your face because it has all those high timbre yeah. colors to it. Because mm-hmm, it's got the full overtones. Not like a bassoon yeah. or a contra bassoon or a bass clarinet. Or you know, a bassoon and contra bassoon are kind of thinner. They don't have that yeah. mid range. A little bit more buttery like yeah. a clarinet. Yeah. What gives it that, that overtones? Oh. Well, the the reed, you know, mm. it's, it's making some buzz. The buzz. It's a metal instrument. And it's a metal instrument. Mm. So it has the power of a brass instrument. Mm. Yeah. You know what would be kind of cool is to connect all the instruments of the orchestra together with tubing. <laughs> and see oh, what gosh. happens. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like the only reed with brass, right? Like the only Reed brass, instrument. true. Reed yeah, brass. it's like a brass reed. Oh. But all they, you know, I mean, reed. Yeah, reed. reed. Yeah. I mean, there were, there were metal clarinets back oh, in the yeah. day, I think. Oh, wow. But it's not, it's not 
the sound. Mm. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, it's those, you know, I think composers wanted those instruments to be warmer, you know? They, you know, when they wanted something brassy and edgy, they went to the to the brass or the mm. strings, you know, not the woodwinds. Yeah, mm. I know. When I think about using a saxophone, um, I always try and get the the older saxophone style because there's like some new saxophone sound that came, I guess, with like new age jazz and funk and stuff, and it's just so bright and shrill. Alto. Oh, yeah, like yeah. something. Yeah, especially the alto suffers a lot from that, so I would never want that. And then on the other coin, there's another sound. It's very West Coast. You know, it's like Eric Marienthal, big fat band kind of sound. That's so <laughs> iconic that you wouldn't ever want to use it because people would think immediately of, you know, these kinds of West Coast bands, and so I would always stay away. And personally, I go more towards like the East Coast sound. Because it's yeah, it sounds more ethnic, almost like an ethnic uh, yeah. instrument. Cultural. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's got its own rich thing, and it's not aware of you, and so it, it does the weird things that you want it to. Yeah, that West Coast sound is a bit Miles Davis, '80s, just rebellious. I don't give a beep, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. sound. Well, even like the really slick sound too, you know, where it's like the yeah, you know, and the guitars like super clean and perfectly yeah. balanced and the horn yeah. section is super tight like it's cool yeah but you know it's like you, you could feed dinner to your grandma off of the the record because it was so clean and tight right and, you know but you don't want that necessarily <laughs> in your score <laughs> Dallas keeps getting me in this podcast <laughs> Sorry. I mean you could feed your grandma it. with that kind of music <laughs> but could you actually date a girl with it <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> That's good. Uh, yeah, go ahead and ask your questions below, everyone, and uh, we'll get into it. Uh, total switch of uh, concepts here. Money transfer services. Hannah Woolmer asks, has anyone else thought about using PayPal when being paid for international projects? Has anyone done any experience about that? Is PayPal good at dealing with international disputes if one should arise? Um, it put my mind at ease if I could get paid at the end of the project and wouldn't need any complicated international legal issues. Um, so, interesting. I think uh, that this is important to bring up some concerns that might have to do Yeah, with I've done international work and I used PayPal and it was fine. I mean, uh, if you want to not have to ask that question, I don't know if you always can avoid it, but I would just say work with people you trust and then you don't even have to, you know, worry if things go south because they won't. If someone but, seems kind of uh, shady, would you... Like offer a different? Would you kind of be like, yeah, let's do this different payment? Probably method, like possibly. payment all up front. Okay, okay. If if I really wanted the gig or it was good money, but I didn't really trust them. But that's yeah. you know that's weird. <clears throat> and it also depends on the client. I mean, uh, you may want to establish trust with them, and so therefore you may want to go with whatever they're suggesting is their primary service. Okay. You know, I think. If you don't want to use their service, it means you don't value their relationship. Mm. You don't value this gig. Okay. And that might be the case for cheaper gigs. Yeah. You know? But that goes all the way back to the beginning of the show today, which is like, see if you can see the potential in that person, you know, in that client or whatnot. And see beyond just what you're being paid in the little box for the thing you're going to do. And maybe also where they're going to go with their career and, and have, you know, establishing a strong relationship of trust and collaboration, right. you know. So um, whatever they say, do that. Whatever yeah. they say. You can't really... And if that doesn't work, just leave it and move on to your next gig. Don't be a whiner. Yeah, you can't, yeah. Really, you can't really gain trust if you don't sacrifice for it, I guess. That's you know, right. Like how do you gain someone tr- someone's trust if you're not putting yourself out there? This is not like a job that... You don't take risks in, you know, even your melodies should be risky. Um, But some things to think about uh, is currency conversions. The currency conversion rates on PayPal are usually a few days uh, old and have a larger spread because of that, you see. Uh, Kyle knows a lot about the VIG, you know, and the spread in (laughs) currencies and however much that lags, therefore, in order to stay within a profitable trajectory for the current conversion rate, you have to have a wider spread between the two different currencies. And therefore, you can lose as much as 10% in the transfer. It's very true. Exactly. On bad currency rates. So therefore, some people recommend alternatives such as TransferWise is another one. 
uh, Venmo, people use, Square, and check out Stripe. That requires you to become a kind of a pretty trusted um, business with Stripe and have a lot of previous transactions. Uh, but with uh, Stripe, uh, they have some of the lowest percentages that they take, and they have like right up to the current moment, current um, currency rate conversions, and very very tight spread. This yeah. one I use, it's called Zelle, and it's I like it because it goes into your account like right away. I yeah. mean, it's in there. Yeah, that's a pretty you know. big one. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But like the difference between PayPal's currency rate and Square and TransferWise and Venmo and Stripe, the difference between all those, the different, the, what's, what you're spending all of your time on is going to save you like 150 bucks. Who cares? Do do the work, do the job, use whatever service it is. Would you pay one hundred and fifty dollars? I mean, let's say it's a five thousand dollar gig, and you're going to lose forty seven dollars going one route versus another route, dude. You know, like you could do a lot more. You could probably make that forty seven dollars with that five thousand dollars in a week. So just don't start to, you know start act like a weasel with like your clients saying like, eh, you know, can you do that? Maybe this the other way and this and that. There's, there's way too much cost to your career and that relationship by going that route. Right. right. That it's not worth the $42 or $12 or $16 that you're going to get in addition to that. So, you know, just have beans that night. So start right. a can of beans Take if you cost. act like that, you know, but don't push those kinds of like cheapnesses onto your client relationships and the future of your career. My God. I think that's true. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's probably good enough. About that. Info on that. That's subject. There's some ideas for you. That's all I have to say. That's all I have to say about, about that. <laughs> <laughs> What's that cookie one? Or the cookie one? Uh, that's Jim the way Perry the cookie says, crumbles. That's the way the cookie crumbles, you know. Um, now, uh, let me just take a quick look at uh, if there's any questions from the audience. All right. We have one from Brian Mullen, who asks, uh, does anyone use Vienna Symphonic Library, BSL, particularly the special edition? Because recently I completed a large project using special editions one and two as my main orchestral libraries. And while I quite like the strings, the orchestral strings, particularly for flexibility of mixing and third party reverb, I found the cello patches consistently sawy and they popped out of the texture tonally mm. um, in a way that didn't happen with violins, viola, and basses. Has anyone else experienced this? Do I need to be fiddling with velocity curves or are the full string libraries any better or do I simply need to look at other companies' string libraries? I Just speaking in general, I've heard a lot of scores where to compensate for volume, um, the, the the composer turns up the, the dynamic crossfade on the instrument like all the way to 127, so it's like the screaming loud fortissimo texture. Um, but then, you know, the, it ruins the sound. You get that really harsh sound when you should really be operating your instruments in like a much milder range within the, you know, from 0 to 127, you know, between like... Would you say like 25 and 100 is probably like mm -hmm. the best? And anything over that you should really say because it's mm -hmm. a very... It, mo for most libraries it gets to a, an almost unprofessional sound, like a cacophonous. Mm -hmm. They kind of, you know, give it a little too much. One of the first things I do when I get a library is go in and change the cur velocity curves on every single instrument that's in mm -hmm. there. There's only one library that I've never done that for, and we talk about that library and a lot of other libraries in our program, The Inside Score. If you want to subscribe to that, the link's below, and we'll, you can find out what those libraries are. But yeah, you want to go in there and you want to adjust those curves to where like from about 100 to 127, you're rarely using. You, that's like your extra range, you know? Most curves on these libraries are just like linear. Hey, that's how we recorded it, so therefore that's how the instruments played it, so therefore that's how the instruments must want to sound. Therefore, chop it up that's evenly. Like, you know. I mean, that's like the engineer is, is saying, the engineer and the manufacturer of the library is saying, hey, we're not going to be a conductor at all on this. We're just going to say, hey, put all the musicians in a room, let's play this. Everybody play 
double forte, and then now they're, everybody play double piano, everybody play mezzo forte. Well, that's it then, I guess. You know, you guys must know what you're talking about. It's like a, a recording <laughs> engineer who won't touch the faders because he's like, well, you know, that's yeah. that's the, oh, the dynamics God. the uh, musicians intended, and I don't want to <laughs> alter the performance. That has to really, really touch a nerve in Kyle because <laughs> that is just so common. Like, what are you doing? Yeah. It's like, no, 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 you can't do Or, Or you go to a dubbing mixer in cinema, go to a dubbing mixer, and you go, hey, can you turn up music? Oh, no, man, the LEDs are at, like, you know, there's only six more LEDs left here. You know, music's not ever supposed to go above negative 17.2 luffs. <laughs> so, you know. Yeah, always right. luffs. I feel like there's a lot of, yeah, a lot wow. of uh, engineers follow these very conservative rules very conservatively. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I do, I, I don't, I think when you, when you do safe, mixing and safe recording engineering you're not going to stand out a lot you really do have to kind of it is it is knowing the instruments it's knowing their their tone their 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 timbre understanding how far they can go without pushing your recording without clipping obviously i think we all have that worry but at the same regard we don't really realize how far you have to be pushing it to be going into over maximum wow this is this sounds like nothing but a bunch of pops so um, that's something I follow to a lot of uh, engineers, uh, mixing engineers, recording engineers. They they say the same thing. You you have to pick and choose when you're going to be conservative and when you're going to make broad, e you know e um, eq changes, compression changes. Um, you know, I mean, making that ride levels, ride levels, just go exactly automate exactly automation, understanding when you're like you know I'm, we're just going to pump this and it's you're going to feel it, and if you go to you know negative. One, <laughs> do you know, DBS, you know, as long as you're still not hitting that, mm -hmm. hitting that red zone, if uh, there's even ways to mix where it's uh, kind of the whole debate when it comes to the loudness wars. I don't know if you guys are <laughs> the, the loudness wars. wars. Sure, I've heard of the loudness wars. Yeah, um, it's more of a mix, you know, music production sort of uh, uh, theory and kind of a debate. But um, I could even see the smart engineer like playing up against the loudness wars and go super high and then the rest of the track you can drop down super you know you can get creative you can do especially in this field can, especially in yeah there's there's no i think that one now, side that's i think that somebody who good. who just lets things be because that's what they were told and those numbers are what they're supposed to be that's at. what they yeah they get those i mean who's in control of you Right, right, exactly. Okay. I exactly. mean, if you want to have an imprint, I mean, Quincy Jones doesn't give a crap. Give it, no, no. He, he, you do what he tells you because he's got the ideas, you know. Um, he's in control. And look at what that did for him, you know. It, right. Have an opinion, have a reason why you might move it around. Um, and if, if you ask for something and an engineer says, you can't do that, it's not possible, don't believe him. Don't believe don't them. Usually believe they, them. they just don't want to do it. Say it a little it's bit probably more, what it is. Say it a little more diplomatically if you have to. Yes. Um, make them do it, and then let's do a comparison. Hmm. Um, there are, for sure, there are some real examples why you know you can't hit subwoofers at certain levels in 5.1, and you know various. There's various. There's a couple things you want to adhere to, but even those rules can be broken yeah. for real reasons. Absolutely. Um, but so, like, you want to approach string libraries like a conductor. Like, if it's if something's out of whack, change it. If something's out of whack, get in there and fix it. You're the conductor of exactly. your own music. I think the conductor has been taken out of the composing process too much because everyone uses MIDI now, you know? And then they're like, well, all right, everybody else has conducted this and figured this out for me, and so now all i got to do is, like... You know, what do you do? You, oh, you mix this test tube with this tube? That's how you make music? Oh, okay, cool. I can do that. No, no, no. Think for yourself. Have control of your art. Have control over your tools. Change your tools to fit what you want. Be in control of yourself. Yes. Um, some other string libraries that said that you might want to go after, though, as well, are uh, cinematic, uh, cinematic Studio Strings, CSS. And Spitfire's Albion is commonly used by quite a few um, kind of Hans Zimmer style yeah. composers. Uh, actually, uh, Eve says, sorry, going back to velocity, he says percussion sounds better at low velocity. I wanted to uh, say that's absolutely true because when you get the high, especially with any kind of drums, the, the tension in the head fights back and you get this snappy sound. Right. And it doesn't travel well. You want this really loose, kind of yeah. in control. Yeah. Yeah, why is why is Eve right about that? Because he's a drummer. <laughs> <laughs> he knows. Like, when is he playing drums? <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen to guys who you know who are 
experts on these things. And even if you ask the studio musicians, they'll say, yeah, I went in the studio, you know, I played well, and then they asked me to play really loud, and I was like, you sure? And they're like, yeah, like, yeah, sure, because I never play like that. And then they play for them, and then suddenly everybody who doesn't know trumpet is... 127, you know, and the, the bell is shaking on every oh, note. Oh, yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. So there's no way you're going to get a What guy. are some other string libraries um, out there that people could take a look at in alternative to Vienna Symphonic Library? Hmm. Spit, Spitfire has a whole bunch of them. Um, and, and there's also uh, Orchestral Tools. That's another good one. Yeah. I'd, I'd say uh, just just one example is the Robo Guel, which is a Tina's okay. cello, and that's a pretty good one. Yeah. Yeah, because she's a great cellist. Yeah. And it, it, you don't need much at all. It, it's not fancy. There's already three three libraries from her, which is pretty cool. You know, yeah. so you can get Tina Guel the original, Tina Guel 2.0, and oh. Tina Guel Robo Guel Robo Guel Robo Guel <laughs> Robo Guel. <laughs> Yeah, she's, uh, I think, going to be going on tour again with Hans Zimmer this year. Cool. Yeah, awesome. Splendid. Cool. Well, that was a good show, everybody. If you have any questions, put them down below. We'll answer them next week. And uh, if you're an aspiring composer, uh, don't forget to check out our upcoming seminar, Super Seminar, Total Scoring Mastery. Uh, the link is down below, or just type in Total Scoring Mastery into Google, and I'll take you right to it. All right, All right. guys. See Thanks, you later. Guys.